S. Hello and welcome to another episode of Digging with Flow. This week we're joined by a Turner Prize winning artist. Born in Birkenhead on the Wirral, he moved to London in the 1980s to go to art school and pursue his dreams of being a punk rock star. His artwork often encompasses themes of nostalgia and cultural identity, usually expressed through music. The music that's coming out of like SoundCloud or all the rest of it, it's just so fucking strange and wonderful and bizarre. <laughs> I, I get very excited about that. What I like about music or I like about pop music is when you take the form, when you take the structure of it and you fuck about with it and you break it. You break the pattern and that's, what, that, that's what's always thrilled me. Perhaps his best-known piece, a film called Fiorici Made Me Hardcore, includes clips of northern soul dances alongside Hacienda-esque rave scenes. Another work was a life-size reconstruction of the motorway bridge that links Liverpool with the Wirral. Work like this has often resonated with me as someone who grew up in the suburbs and who also has a fondness for nostalgia. I also really wanted to talk to him about his new adventure, his own sort of art school, the Music and Video Lab. He's an inspirational man with a great sense of humour, and despite having zero gardening experience, he joined me on the allotment for my favourite task of potato planting. He was also a trooper in the face of torrential rain, which you'll hear later in the show. This week, we're digging with Mark Leckie. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Today we're planting potatoes. Fantastic. Have you ever done this before? I did when I was a kid. Multiple times? Um, no. Once? Um, I can't remember. I had, I had this sort of, not a flashback, but a sort of recall. When I saw the earth and the potatoes, I realised I'd done it before. Was it a positive flashback or a, a horror? Yeah, well, I, yeah it, didn't, it didn't upset me. OK, <laughs> but it didn't fill you with joy and excitement. <laughs> Maybe I was forced to, maybe, I don't know, maybe it's a greater, you know, my family's Irish, or maybe it's like... Oh, an ancestral... Maybe it's an ancestral thing with, like, yeah, potatoes. I'm going to give you some gloves. Thank you. There's another pair here, if they are too small or too big. I can't All remember right, which okay. one is big and which one's small. Um, and I will talk you through how to do it. We'll do All it right. together. It's pretty simple. Unless you remember how to do it and you want to just have a stab at it. <clears throat> no. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I almost did. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's get to it. So over here is the patch that we've uh, prepared for us. Okay. It's been turned and weeded and ready to go, and we've got twelve premier potatoes. They're okay. A, a blight resistant early crop potato. Okay. Particularly delicious, I'd say. All right. And we're going to do two rows of six potatoes here. So on this line, yeah. we're going to dig small holes that will fill with a little bit of compost. Then we put the potato in, a bit more compost, and then we ridge it over, which is when you pull the earth either side to make a potato ridge, that the nice. potatoes grow in and, and multiply under the earth. Okay. But I'm trying to think about how best to do it. I think let's both do one. I'll start there and you can start there. Yeah. And then we'll sort of swap over. And then that way, if you're having any trouble, I can help you, but I shouldn't imagine you will. So we're gonna have a line each. A line each. And I'm going to... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, and then we'll get really busy. Yeah, all right. We'll have a line each. And, yeah. then, and then I'm going to start by the... Um, that pole. The stick. So you're not a big gardener in your day-to-day -day life? No, I've never done gardening in my life. Really? No. And no I'm, desire to? And Lizzie, you are married to, says that... I don't notice. She's really into flowers and plants, and, and she says that I don't notice them. I don't notice if they're alive or they're dead. Tell us a bit about what's a day in the life of Mark Leckie like at the moment in 2023. OK. At the moment, I am getting ready for a show in Margate. They asked me to commission emerging artists, I guess, to make a work, and then and I make a work as well. Oh, right. In response to their work? No, it's just... We all, we all make work, to, well, not together, but we all make work parallel. There's a couple of sound artists, but most of the others are making videos. A lot of it's come together actually through doing NTS. So 
Klein, I'm hoping, is in it. Ice Boy Violet, Ashley Holmes. There's another musician called Lucy Duncombe. And the name of the show is In The Offing. When you look out to sea, the offing is the part of the sea just before the horizon. It's when you're able to see things coming to shore. Ooh. So it's like the, the future is moving towards the present. So that's the name of the show, In The Offing. And when you don't have a commission that you're sort of working towards, do you find yourself still making things regularly? Like, do you find that for you, making art or making collage, you know, audiovisual collages or music or whatever it is, is sort of a compulsion? Or is it something that sometimes you think sort of, you know, sod this, I don't want to do it? <laughs> um, I think it's definitely a compulsion. I'm always looking for an opportunity. And maybe, maybe an opportunity isn't meant to be particularly making a work. It might be something that's like, I don't know, uh, writing an essay for someone or something. Mm. If I'm not occupied with making work, then I, 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 I get into all sorts of difficulties. Mm. So like during lockdown, pandemic, that, that you know, that, I, I found I wasn't making work then and I found that difficult. And, but then again, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep blowing smoke up NTS's arses. Uh, N mm. Arses, arse. Can then the NTS have a collective <laughs> arse arse up the collective arse <laughs> eye. Um, doing the show and making music and thinking about what I was doing, that, that kind of, that stopped me just, I don't mm. know, whatever, whatever. It stopped me from whatever, from the brink. Going bonkers. Going bonkers, yeah, that's the best way of putting it, mm. I guess. Um, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a need and I do, it does, I do worry about not being able to do it for whatever reason, if, if, you know, if the world gets bored of me or whatever, or, or I fall out of fashion, it does that. I do think, how, what would I do then? Mm. So I, do, I just carry on as, I kind of, I don't know, I take as many of those opportunities as I can. Um, and just with the hope that I can keep, keep doing it. Keep doing it, yeah. Was that the same when you were younger, making art, or is that uh, No, that when I was younger, I, I got very lost, and I think that's what... And art, art saved me from that, and I guess that's what I'm still... Uh, I guess that, that, that still is an anxiety about being mm. lost again. I mean, I need a hobby. Well, maybe you're <laughs> like, about to fall in love with something. Yeah. I do need something outside of art, because it's like... Because I, I kind of... You know, I've, I've sort of, I've invested everything in it. Mm. Um, when you talk about art, do you think of art, like uh, visual, physical art, in the same way as music? Like when you think about the compulsion to make, or I don't know, because I, I, I read somewhere that you went to art school to be in a band, and that yeah. music was sort of your, your, not your primary love, but was one of the things that came first for you. Yeah. I mean, that's a hobby and an interest, music. Or do you kind of think of them in the same breath? I do. I think of work? them in the same. I think of them the same. Mm. I mean, the only thing that stops me from thinking of myself as a musician is that I have no musical abilities. Um, I'm, 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 I mean, I'm not tone deaf, but I'm tone um, ugly. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I can't. I can't quite tell the difference between notes. Whether it's music, whether it's art, whether it's even something on like TikTok or whatever, mm. whoever that person's kind of like intention and, and investment in what they're doing is kind of powerful enough or, or creates enough energy, then that's what I think of as art. Within those terms, I think quite a lot of things are art. It's not, it's a, it's a kind of, it is an everyday thing. It's not, I mean, there's great art, which is something else. Yeah. <laughs> and it's more, it's much rarer, I guess. But just in terms of like art as an as a kind of idea, as a kind of creative act, it's like it's quite an everyday. I wouldn't say mundane because it's it's transformative and powerful. But it's it's you know you can find it mm. <laughs> if you go looking for it, it's there. 
I can't remember where I read this or watched some, somewhere some of you saying it, but when you grow up somewhere like the Wirral or the suburbs where you're on the cusp of something and near it but not there, you notice things and you find beauty in lots of things, you know, a bus route I think was the example you oh, used right. yeah. or like, I don't know, a, a good looking building or, you know, suburban architecture or, or bridges and whatever, yeah. you know, yeah. romanticising the mundane things of your life. Yeah. It's hard to pinpoint why, what the link is between being slightly on the cusp of something and finding interest in that. But it just made me think of it then when you said you can find beauty and transcendence right. in lots of things around you. I wonder if that's also partly because you've had this life growing up as an observer. Yeah. It's a, I, I think it's a great quality in a person. It makes your life much more fun if... Yeah, you can I mean, I don't know if it's enjoy just. Enjoy the bus. I think that that proximity to something that has got that is, you know, radiating a, a, a large energy, you know, and you're not within the field of that. You're on the you're you're on the outskirts. You're on the outside of that mm. field, but you're you're feeling the kind of like, you know, the waves, the energy waves, and um, in a in an obvious way, you're not taking it for granted. You're not making the assumption this is just the way the world is, because mm. you kind of know. You know, you look in the other direction, and you know that those things don't happen outside of the city. Mm. But I think if, I don't know if you grow up in the city, maybe you just assume that's like that's like my daughter just thinks London is the world. You know what I mean? It's like that. All places are like that. Mm. And you're like, it's not. Do you feel like you'll stay in London? Sometimes I feel I'm trapped in London. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. <laughs> but uh, where else would I go now? Where else would you go exactly? Would you say it's home now? Yeah, I mean I've been here 30 years. Yeah, so and you've got kids and stuff. I've got kids. Right? I think if I didn't have the kids, I don't know if I'd be here still. Do you think you'd be back on the Wirral, or do you think you'd no. be somewhere else? I'd, I had a fantasy about me and Lizzie had a fantasy about living in LA. There's a couple of friends about the English. They're living out in. Eagle Rock or whatever, and they got a swimming pool, and it all seems like, oh, God, that's the life we wanted. And then he told me that they have to keep an axe by their door now because of the, because of the fires. Fucking hell. They have to be ready to go, you know what I mean? It's mm. just like, and you're just like, ah. Fuck that. Fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, don't want to live with an axe next to the door, you know. So I don't know, no. Have you ever lived anywhere else? I lived in America for a bit. I lived in... San Francisco, Las Vegas. I lived in Las Vegas for a bit. Yeah. What was that like? Hot, horrible. That place is the arsehole of the world, man. Why were you there? It's like living in hell. <laughs> <laughs> when I go to hell, it'll be exactly we're like Caesar's Palace. I know that's what it looks like. It's um, it's a horrible place. It's like it's so desperate and there. Uh, How long were you there for? Two days. No. Uh, <laughs> so like, uh, about six months. I was living in San Francisco, and I met this guy who was like, whenever I see Elon Musk, he, he reminds me of this guy. He's called John, and he was like super bright, like you know, he's a geek basically. And he said, I'm thinking of going to Vegas and doing the websites for all the casinos. And I was doing graph. I was sort of doing, trying to learn web design at that or, draw, or graphics anyway. How old are you at this point? Oh, I'm so I'm quite. I'm not young. Okay. I'm like th early thirties, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah early thirties. Yeah. So, and I was just, you know, all I was doing is I was I was cooking in San Francisco. I was a line cook, so it wasn't like I didn't have anything there. So I was like, yeah, fuck, let's go. So I went with him and his brother. His brother was a deadhead. Sick. He was about six foot eight, and he was a, he was a, like this massive deadhead, and his brother was massive as well. And we got there and went to the casinos, and it's like you know it's a it's not a mafia town anymore, but it's a it's a gangster town. You can't you can't go up and knock on the doors of casinos and say, "Can I do your website?" <laughs> um, and he bought a house and they put it in this, they call it escrow, don't they, in over there? Is what it does escrow? That mean? I don't I never found out what that meant. It's always on um, yeah. Housewives. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. What's that? It, so we were in escrow. Escrow to me means limbo, because <laughs> yeah. we were basically fucking stuck there. So we were stuck in this hotel room. There was me and these two brothers, who, like I say, were both about six, eight, sleeping in a hotel room together for six months. Fucking hell. And they didn't, they didn't drink, they didn't like going out. 
So I'd just go out and walk around the casinos every night, getting free, you know, yeah, free get your free, your free cocktail, which has got nothing in it. So you can't even get drunk on it. And that, yeah, that was it. Six months of doing that. <laughs> what a time. <laughs> it, was, it was really, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was bad. And then I met someone in Vegas and we got married for a green card. And that got me to New York, that got me out. Amazing. Yeah. And then did you stay in New York for And a then bit? I stayed in New York, which I loved. So I got to New, I got to New York and this marriage didn't go well, <laughs> as those kind of marriages <laughs> tend to do. You know, basically she kicked me out and I was like, I was stuck in New York on my own, didn't really know anyone. And the only, the only person I did know who lived in New York was this fashion designer called Lucy. And I went to stay with her and she was married to Gavin Brown, who was just starting his gallery. Oh, wow. And they had two kids. Me and Gavin just became friends. I just, I wasn't looking to make art. And he set up a gallery. I just ligged around with, with them for like two years. But it was like, like so much, yeah, it was good, good times. Wow. And then, and then that's how I kind of got into making art. Wow. God, it is sometimes right place, right time. Oh, so it's ridiculous. It's yeah. ridiculous. It is luck. It is. I mean, it's, it's always hard to say to someone younger when they ask about these things and you're like, fuck, you know, I just got lucky. But before that, I was quite unlucky. Mm. I was in London for like four years and it was like, I, I just, it was very lonely and didn't get any work. Mm. And it sucked. That's, mm. why, that's how I ended up leaving. I was just nothing, nothing good happened to me when I was in London. In, and then I went to America and then my luck changed, basically. That's, wow. That's why I, I don't know. I suppose it is luck, but also you said yes to things. I said yes to things, but also I always liked clothes and I used to, I basically used to dress up. And so... People notice you. Well, they had to. Yeah. That's quite good <laughs> advice. They had, they had no choice. A good look will carry a long way, you know what I mean? What kind of things look, were you wearing? My, my accent sounds bad if I say look and look. I mean, look, L-O-L-O-K. Yeah. Or a Luke, right? A Luke. A Luke, L-E-W-K. Oh, I had loads of mad things I used to wear. I used to wear a head-to-toe Burberry. That's what I was wearing in New York. Oh, nice. I wore head-to-toe Burberry. That was my look there. I used to have a red velour tracksuit. That was a, that was a good look. Um, I just yeah I liked I like I always liked clothes, like from from when I was a kid, from when yeah. I was like a like a casual and all the rest of it. What's the what's the style of a casual? That was like you know like a sort of 80s football hooligan. Yeah. Wow. That's quite on vogue now, I'd say. Yeah, it keeps coming away. It hasn't sort of hasn't gone away really, mm. has it? A timeless look. I guess it's kind of mod as well, isn't mm. it? Like, if I go back home, if I go back to the port or go back to... It's like everyone still dresses like that. Now it's all, like, Stone Island and... Mm. But when I was a kid, it was quite... It was quite experimental. It's like, different looks every week. It was, like, a kind of golf look where you'd wear all, like, Pringle and Lyle and Scott. And then there was a look that was, like, a kind of geography teacher, sort of corduroy jacket with leather arm patches. That was, like, a look for a while. Dungarees. Yeah, there's all these different looks. Do you keep a lot of that stuff? No. So you're not a... Because you're such... I would describe an archivist as sort of... Not a digital hoarder, but you're a digital... Uh, history enthusiast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so does that yeah. not translate into things in real life? Do you keep physical objects and attach sort of... Well, because of, like, of that... You know, I was up in I was in Newcastle and then I came down to London and then we were like we were squatting in London. Yeah, you can't really have a lot of stuff no, if you're I could, I bouncing around. I just had a suitcase full of stuff for years, you know. Um, I'm not doing my job here. I was, I've, I've stopped. That's okay. You can is that, just, is that you enough? Can just chat. That's plenty. Yeah, that's yeah? plenty. But I'm and then start another one. What? Look at that bloody worm. Oh, like here. Oh, that's massive. Crazy. Oh, yeah. Crazy one. Um, They're yeah. beautiful, aren't they? They're I love insane. The way they move. I don't know what that part is about. Yeah, I never know what that part's about. It's like a, a jacket. Sort of per polo yeah. neck, isn't it? Like a turtle neck. <laughs> it's his look. <laughs> it's his look. He's on his way to New York. Got, see, we noticed him. <laughs> see? It's effective. <laughs> um, 
Yes, that is plenty deep enough. Okay. Is that more like composty there? Yeah, so what is it's this stuff on the top is I don't know what it's, it's manure. Really. Manure. All right, yeah, great. It's manure. My agent didn't mention <laughs> manure. I'm a big TikTok fan, actually. I mean, I feel a bit weird about it because I'm just lurking. I mean, I don't... You don't post? I don't post my dance routines on TikTok. But, um, but I do... I mean, I sort of get... I get it second-hand. I, get, I usually get it through Twitter. That's me too. Yeah, so that's that's uh, so I'm not I'm not really I don't really browse it, but I get I'll go and look at some of that I've been alerted to on Twitter. Mm. But it's I think it's interesting for someone whose work is so often nostalgic and celebrating movements of the past. You don't seem to have any I don't know reluctance to adopt the contemporary right. world that we live in. You know. Well, that's because I think the contemporary is nostalgic. Uh, or nostalgia is a big part of the contemporary condition. Now there's like big 20 year cycles, but then there's little cycles, you know, within those cycles. You know that some of it's coming from a kind of a, a, a want or a need to understand the past or to kind of, or to measure the past against the present, but it's also kind of, it's also algorithmic, you know, it's been produced, you know, nostalgia gets, so it's not that I'm nostalgic, it's just, I just think that's, I make work about that because that's how it just feels to be alive now. You know, mm. that, that, that's the kind of contemporary condition, like I say, oh, is, is, is nostalgic. Mm. Even like an idea of the future is kind of like sort of retro, isn't it? So I'm, I'm off on one. Go on, yes, go on. Well, I was just going to say, I was listening to a podcast, a football podcast that I like, and they were talking about kit cycles Yeah. in football kits yeah. and how there's so many now. Right and how it's hard for kits to become iconic because they don't play long enough in them. So you don't get, you know, like multiple seasons where you see your team win in a certain strip or whatever, because yeah. there's, there's two per season away and home or whatever it is. Yeah. And they were talking about that and they were talking similarly um, about money, obviously, and how like making these like retro looking kits makes companies big bucks yeah but also they were saying that people seem to like them because they tap into a time and they evoke a feeling of a time when football was felt a bit more real yes and more tangible and i think exactly. that is so applicable across yeah, everything yeah, like yeah, yeah. people look back on 90s rave because at, with this like fond nostalgia or whatever because it was when music and community and yeah looseness yeah. felt more real now everything is layered in this yeah exactly weird Sheen. Yeah, definitely. It's interesting, but you you definitely, like at least in your NTS show, like musically, certainly, you play a lot of musicians who make use of like really contemporary, futuristic sounds, like people like 454 or Teaser Korean, like musicians who do mad manipulation on their vocals. And yeah. Like, sound like this. <laughs> and it sounds like it could only be made now or in five, ten years' yeah. time. So I think it's like, it's not just... It's not just nostalgia because it's the time. Like you do also tap into con stuff that could only be now. Yeah. And to me, at least, that kind of music is not nostalgic. No, not at all. Well, mate, I don't know. And maybe, 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 maybe it's it is. It's it the contradiction in all of this. Is that you know when people hark back to rave or they hark back to like the casuals or whatever mm. those movements, those those, those subcultures. You know, they were they were forward facing. They were like trying to represent this this you know how the world feels at that moment. That's what I've always liked about music mm. and fashion. Mm. I mean, I listen to a lot of music from the past, but I don't like music that harks back. That's made now that harks back. I feel exactly the, to the same. The past, I'm not really interested in that. And I think, also, I think that the music that's coming out of like SoundCloud or all the rest of it is just so fucking strange and wonderful and bizarre. <laughs> I, I get very excited about that. What I like about music or I like about pop music is when you take the form, when you take the structure of it, and you fuck about with it, and you break it, you break the pattern, and that's what that that's what's always thrilled me. I can only go to the edge of noise music. 
I like my music, kind of poppy. But when you introduce noise into pop and start to like break pop with that, that's when I that's when I really like it. Totally. You know, and that's what all those musicians are doing. It's just, and it is. I don't know. I I, I find it kind of weird that it's not more acknowledged that. You know, there's this idea that the past was like a... I mean, it's always the way, but, you know, the music hasn't moved on since... But it has so much. But it has, you know, it, it has. It and has this idea so that it's, yeah. People are very dismissive yeah, of I think, I mean, that I think kind of so. new music, I think. Well, they're just not even... I don't know. They'd rather wallow in their own kind of, like, nostalgia, you know, back to nostalgia. Yeah. Too. People, I think, as well, can be dismissive of music that's made electronically. Yeah, and there's that, exactly. Oh, I did that, I went the wrong way. Yeah, is it exactly. Oh, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter if you go on the other side. Um, all right, so I've managed to do six holes on my row. Mark's done about two, 2.5. <laughs> <laughs> so four more to go before we get to the fun part, really. Yeah. The next part, this is probably the longest bit, the, the digging of the holes. And then, right. And then we bed in the potatoes, basically. The digging the holes is fun. It's I'm quite just, it's just, it's just because I'm talking. I can't multitask. It's fine, that's, that's what you're here but for. But I'm really. enjoying digging the holes. I could, I could do that <laughs> that's for, good. for quite a, all day, maybe. <laughs> okay, that's good. What kind of music do you have on at home? I do the show every month, and then sometimes I will be. It'll combine with whatever I'm doing, making, making artwork. I made a piece last year that was about Byzantine iconography. <laughs> wow. And so I'd, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd start listening to some Gregorian chants. And I like pop, but I also like the esoteric. I make a compilation that I call Joy. What have I got on that? Fleetwood Mac. Some old ragger, <laughs> uh, Tiger. I like the late 70s, when you're getting into sort of post-punk. I like that stuff a lot. Early 80s, late 70s. I think around... 69, 70 as well. Early, very early 70s, there's loads of amazing stuff. I like doo-wop, I love doo-wop. I love doo-wop. So I listen to a lot of doo-wop. So I'm, I th I've got very, ca very, very Catholic tastes. So a little bit too much. I like, I like, um, I like musical theater as well. I listen to that. I love, I love a good, witty um, music, a bit of music theater. Um, so I listen to like, you know, I've got like a couple of songs from Matilda I listen to. The new one? Yeah, I love it's it. So good. It's great. So yeah, any, any, anything that's kind of smart, I think, I guess mm. that's what I'm looking for. I like music where it's trying. That's like my sort of main thing. I, I like it when people really give it a good go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, but, and I don't know, I can listen to something that maybe isn't a genre I love, but if someone's really, I don't know, putting yeah. it all in it. I feel it. Yeah, I exactly. feel that as well with, uh, with musical theatre. Yeah. Did you ever dabble? The, in musical th I can't, I can't, like I say, I'm not musical, I can't. Can you act? I did go to like night classes and, and learn to act, but I was very, I was quite troubled and I, I kind of, um, I overdid it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I could never go back. Uh-oh. Do, do I want to push you on the story? No. no. Let, let, let that one go there. <laughs> <laughs> it was, well, it was just... It was, it was very clichéd. All the other people on, the, on, on there were very nice and middle class, and I was very angry northerner with a big chip on his shoulder, and basically I had an opportunity to kind of act out that, and I sort of... I, I, it, the, the line between art and reality was blurred, let's say that, and I, I didn't go back. Got it, got it. Was, it. I mean, it's intense acting, I'd love to do it. It's very intense. Um, Just looking for a bag of compost. Here it is. Oh. Right, I'll pull this in. Put some compost in here, like that. Yeah. Get it up to about there. Oh, okay. God, they are very deep holes, well done. Are they? Yeah, well are they, are they too deep? A little bit, but oh, just okay. We top oh, them up with the compost. It's better that they're too deep than too I shallow. I could have kept going. Did you have a happy time at art school? Um, no, not, no. I mean, I had a happy time in terms of, like, friendships. And I left in 1990, and I'm still friends with... A lot. I've got a friend here, actually. 
Lucy Rainbow, who lives in Walthamstow. She, she was on the course with me. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, in terms of friendships, yeah, I had a happy time. In terms of... I found it very frustrating. I went to Newcastle Polytechnic and... The art course then was mainly people from sort of the home counties down south who didn't want to go to London and I don't know for whatever reason didn't go to couldn't quite get as far as Edinburgh and when we started there everyone was just it was it was quite, it was quite crusty yeah it was quite it was quite hippy mm -hmm. kind of crusty vibe there and then in the second year, they introduced critical theory, which is like, at that time, was like Foucault and Roland Barthes and sort of French, yeah, French um, philosophy, um, which, is, which is incredibly difficult. And most of the people, including me, I hadn't really, I, you know, we didn't, I didn't have a lot of books when I grew up. I'd read, like, Lord of the Rings, that was about it and some Wilbur Smith. <laughs> and then suddenly you have to read this very difficult, quite obscure, these quite obscure texts, and it just became a real struggle. Yeah, I bet. And at the end of art school, I just thought, I can't, I can't grasp this stuff, I can't, I can't understand it. And, and I left art school thinking I wasn't intellectually enough to be an artist, essentially. So that's why I didn't make art for like 10 years after leaving art school. I just thought, I, I thought I didn't have, I didn't, you know, I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't clever enough. That's what I thought. Mm. I think I need some more compost in <laughs> this, this one's, this one's a bit underwhelmed. Use a bit, use a bit of this. Oh yeah, just put that in, okay, put great. Put a bit of that in. The, okay. the, the idea behind the compost is basically it, it stops it from, um, Okay. It, it provides a little bed for bacteria, right. basically, so that if, if there's anything in this soil... Yeah. So now I'll just top that up with a little bit okay. more, because there's a bag. Can Where's I ask why, why, why do the potatoes look so... Old. Old, yeah. Because they've chitted. What? Chitted? Chitted. Oh, go on, what does that mean? So when you put a potato... The way you grow potatoes... Yeah. So this is just a normal potato that you would eat. Yeah. You put it in the cupboard or somewhere where yeah. it's dark. And these little sprouts, which are called chits, yeah. come off it. And then these chits go on... To, to we bury the potato and these chits will become sprouts that will then sprout off other potatoes. Right. Basically. Okay. So when you plant now you're ready to plant your potato. So they form like a like a like a rhizome or whatever under there. Exactly. Okay. All a right, network okay. of potatoes. Uh, oh. That's I why didn't this know is that. this is my favourite job to do. Okay. Because it's it's quite I feel quite magical. Yeah. Um, Amazing. So you put the potato in. You've put your. So now we've, I'll just say for the benefit of the listeners, we've dug our holes, our yes. six, our 12 holes, two yes. rows of six, and they're looking gorgeous in a, pretty much a straight line. Yeah. And now we've topped up the hole a bit with some, some fresh compost. And then what we do is we place the potato in the middle, chit up like that. And if there's multiple chits like this, you can yeah. put it so that just as many as possible are coming up. Because what that will do is you'll just get more potatoes, basically more sprouts okay then we're going to get a bit more compost and bury it and we're just going to get it to the ground level with the compost all right and then i'm going to ridge it up with a hake i Ooh. mean a rake i, I hake <laughs> with a fish <laughs> with a fish right. in an experimental new gardening yeah. technique from norway great yeah <laughs> can i start chitting up yeah you put them all in oh grand i would love to hear a bit more about music and video lab and, and what that was and Okay. How it went. So you were saying you didn't call it an art school. Yeah. So the idea was to was to. Um, well I mean, well the done. thinking was that if you I'll do this one. if you mention art, then you you potentially create this kind of barrier uh, where people think that art isn't for them. Um, you know, people find art intimidating or think it's not, you know, it's not, um, you know, it's a preserve of the middle classes. It's like a, it's not, it's not for, 
you know, you need you need to be educated, you need to be knowledgeable, you need to be, um, you know, intellectually engaged or whatever before you can kind of go near art. I think a lot of people, even when you get to art school, people are intimidated. I'm still in intimidated by art. I think people are at the very um, bottom of it are kind of terrified about revealing something about themselves mm. because there's no, there's nothing factual about art. It's all made up. That's quite terrifying, actually, <laughs> to think I mean? about. As someone so, who's not an artist, I, so, I would find that a barrier to entry. For yeah, sure. exactly. So it's like nobody knows, ultimately. You never know if you're getting it right. Yeah, kind of and terrifying. so the, the knowledge about art becomes, because it's, it's kind of unknowable, it becomes very esoteric and sort of guarded and, and um, Gnostic. I'll throw that word in for, for beyond the potatoes. Very nice, very nice. Um, very decent. And, uh, you know, and it, it's, it's, you know, it's basically kind of like a priesthood that, that, um, that establish what is art and what's not art. Mm. And so it does feel very, it feels very, even when you're in, like I say, in the midst of it, it can feel beyond you or kind of not open to you. And then, and then that's multiplied by if, you, if your background has got nothing, you know, got no experience of art whatsoever, that's that's multiplied, multiplied tenfold. Now I'm getting really wet, proper Get wet. Oh, has it, it been like this all well, the time? It's absolutely pouring. But that means the potatoes will grow quicker, right? The oh, absolutely, yeah, it's great. It's and this is, this is the realities of, a, of allotment life. Yeah. Is that you have to come rain or shine and, and get it done because the potatoes won't wait. But it's got very wet, very quick. I was, we were basically really enjoying, oh, well, I was really enjoying um, the whole process. And then, and then it just got, uh, and you can't even hold the umbrella now, right? It's just, it became a bit untenable, didn't it? Yeah. It's a, it's a slightly flawed interview um, <laughs> concept. Can I do a bit of Would raking? Would you like to? I'd love to do a bit of raking. Go for it. Uh, go on, so my... what you want to do yeah. is sort of aim the rake in the middle of these two ridges. So this is the line of the potatoes, and you're trying to pull a mountain to the top there. Oh, I see. Yeah, it. all right. We're so making like a, like a, not a furrow, the opposite, like a ridge. Yeah, and yeah. the technique is whack it. Oh, right. Yeah, bang, bang, oh, and then pull it up. I've got nice cross. Exactly, exactly. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, thank you so much for coming to the allotment today. These ridges are beautiful and the potatoes will grow so happily underneath them. <laughs> I was good. No, it was great. It was good. To, I mean, I'm, yeah, I'm very proud. I'm taking, I'm taking a photograph now. Oh, in the photograph, though, it just looks like a grave. <laughs> That's the thing it's with not... the allotment. It never, also, even if it doesn't look like a grave, it just looks like earth. It just looks like earth. It's just sort of... Yeah, you don't, you don't recognise the labour that's gone into it, do you? I really don't. Thank you for listening to Digging. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate and review us on the podcast app that you're using. It really helps more people to discover the pod. To stay up to date with new episodes, you can also subscribe to get the newest episode in your podcast feed straight away. Digging is an NTS podcast hosted by me, Flo Dill. It was produced by Lizzie King with editing by Sam Stone, sound recording by Rory Bowens and mastering by Felix Stock. Our intro music is by the amazing Cleaners from Venus and special thanks on this episode going to Demetrius Malonis. This podcast was made possible thanks to NTS supporters. Become a supporter today for access to additional podcast content, live track lists when listening to NTS radio, access to supporter-only Discord and newsletter and store discount. 50% of supporter proceeds go direct to NTS resident DJs. Find out more at nts.live supporters.